So I think what's helpful here at this Actrams meeting is that we've got new data which is good news for alumtuzumab and should be very reassuring to doctors and patients and regulatory agencies when reviewing when and whether alumtuzumab should be given. So specifically, we have data now that comes at two years after the end of the two-year studies, so four-year data. Most patients have just had the initial cycle of alumtuzumab, which is five days of infusions, and then they will have had a second cycle at month 12 of three days of infusions. And most of them have had no further therapy, so we're looking at three years after the last treatment, and yet patients still have, on average, a disability that is better than at baseline, still improved. They have a low relapse rate, and a low risk of acquiring new disability. And there is no new safety concern. So all of that is very reassuring, and it encourages us to say that alumtuzumab is a durable, effective therapy. Now over and above that, we have one other piece of really exciting data, which is looking at brain volume. So in the pivotal studies for year one and year two, we saw that the brain volume of patients treated with alumtuzumab had shrunk by far less than the brain volume of patients on beta interferon. So already in two years, alumtuzumab was preserving brain tissue. Now, at this meeting, we're presenting the three-year data, which shows that the rate of brain atrophy is now equivalent to a normal, healthy adult, implying that alumtuzumab has really turned things back so we can say to patients now, if you take alumtuzumab, this will prevent tissue loss that otherwise would have occurred. As I say, at four years, with most patients only treated twice, we see the relapse rate of patients in the CARMS one and the CARMS two follow-up equivalent in years three and four as it was in years one and two. And we see that the vast majority of patients have not acquired any new fixed disability, so that the mean disability is still improved from baseline at year three and then at year four in both CARMS1 and CARMS2 follow-up. I think the important thing about alumtuzumab in those places where it is licensed and approved, mm -hmm. as in the European Union, is that it provides another choice for patients and doctors. And specifically, it provides a choice for people who want a drug which is highly effective. So if that is your priority, then alumtuzumab is a good option. The side effects can all be monitored for and treated and cured, provided you um, comply with the follow-up. And it provides this durable, long-lasting efficacy with few infusions. So I think there's a group of drugs that you could say were low risk and low gain, and that's the beta interferon and copaxone drugs. Mm -hmm. And then there are other drugs which are medium risk, medium gain, so the alumtuzumab, compared for instance to natalizumab in patients who don't have JC virus serology. So there are three particular cases where alumtuzumab is a good option. So number one is where people from the outset have clearly aggressive disease, multiple high frequency relapses, and in whom it just isn't safe to leave someone on modestly effective drugs. Number two, patients who have been put on the first line uh, ABCR drugs and who are breaking through with their disease. That's a time to increase the effectiveness of their therapy, and alumtuzumab is a good option there. Then number three, alumtuzumab is a good option for people, women, attempting to start a family, because alumtuzumab is the only drug in the treatment of MS which remains effective whilst it can safely be given through pregnancy. So specifically, after an infusion of alumtuzumab, women need to wait for just four months before they can start to conceive at a time when the drug remains effective.